So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen David, he, him, his. Uh, I am a social worker and a community organizer living in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and I've been working for the past three years now with a group called the Columbus Safety Collective to try and establish uh, non-police emergency response uh, in our city uh, here in Ohio. Um, so really grateful uh, to Jason and all the folks at the Law and Mental Health Conference for giving us an opportunity to talk about the work that we've been doing here in Central Ohio. Um, and recording this before the conference, we're really excited to, um, to be doing all this learning with you all along the way um, and excited to be interacting with folks uh, in the chat today uh, while we're watching this. So um, what I'm gonna do with my time here today um, is I wanna, uh, talk a little bit about like how our group formed and how we see ourselves situated um, in the, the activist ecosystem here in our city. Um, and then I want to talk like a little bit specifically about how um, we are craft, how we crafted our narrative and how we were talking about the dynamics within our city, specifically around existing programs and the need for things that we want to create. Then I'm going to run through the um, the policy pillars that the Safety Collective arrived on through a consensus-based process and um, how we see those fitting into some of the work happening nationally. And then uh, kind of give an update on where we're at uh, in our process uh, with uh, uh, building one of these teams. Um, the short version of that is that at the end of our, um, our last budget cycle in February of 2023, our city council allocated $1.2 million to stand up a non-police emergency response program in Columbus, Ohio. So we are currently in the implementation phase of that, and the Safety Collective remains engaged with the folks in city government around that. So um, I'll give an update on kind of where that stands um, and kind of what the future holds for us. Um, but really excited to talk through this with you all and uh, excited for all the learning that's happening um, and just grateful that this conversation is happening um, in this space. So I'd like to start out with um, you know, how we form the Safety Collective, um, because I, I feel like this, um, this is kind of to me, one of these classic activist stories of, um, you know, the way that things can come together, uh, you know, sometimes through happenstance, but just um, the the importance of engaging in these conversations and and then not knowing where they would necessarily lead us. Um, so for us in Columbus, Ohio, um, the Safety Collective really started uh, with a, um, a meme that uh, went viral in the summer of 2020 uh, by a group called the People's Budget of Columbus. So this was a, a single organizer who created a Instagram account uh, and a Discord channel uh, talking specifically about how cities uh, do their budget process, allocate their funding. Um, and notably because um, of the, the George Floyd uprising of that summer, talking about the way that cities spend um, oftentimes a lion's share of their operating budget on law enforcement. So the People's Budget of Columbus put out this meme uh, said cities are just police departments with some underfunded services on the side. Um, and with this bar chart that uh, was a depiction of the uh, city's operating budget. And so the um, this started to get a lot of traction on social media here. And the Columbus Dispatch, which is our local paper, actually picked this up and ran like a fact check article about it um, and poked some holes in this this graphic, notably because like it has this education line item here, um, you know, and, and so comparing like the $360 million that, that goes to the police had this like $6 million for education. And so the dispatch pointed out rightly that like this is a bit um, of an inaccurate representation. Uh, Columbus City Schools has their own budget that's not part of the city's operating budget. So isn't really an apples to apples comparison here. But seeing this, I was kind of like, well, like this, uh, that fact check I thought was a bit unfair because like um, there is some truth to the fact that like the single biggest outlay in the city of Columbus's operating budget is for law enforcement, as we see in many cities across the country. Um, so I took it upon myself to um, to, to put out a, a version of this graphic here, which is um, what the city of Columbus operating budget actually looks like, where we um, spend around like a third of our money on law enforcement, um, two thirds of the operating budget go for public safety combined. Um, and then I pointed out some of these other departments that our city has that um, such as health and parks and rec, um, notably because these are places where bodies like the Columbus Care Coalition or um, some of these anti-violence programs and credible messenger um, type interventions are being housed in our city. 
And so I tweeted out a version of this graphic. It was to be like a fact check of the fact check. Be like, yes, that other one, like not completely accurate, but like this is the picture that we're looking at where, um, you know, our policy choices at in our city, as in many cities across the country, are to invest in law enforcement as the biggest way we try and deal with social problems, um, in our view, to the detriment of some other places where they could go that are these upstream type interventions around health and housing and wellness. So I um when I tweeted this out, um, an activist that I knew reached out to me and she was like, hey, have you been talking to the folks of the People's Budget of Columbus? You need to join their Discord channel. Um, so I did this. So, you know, she sent me the link to the Discord and I um, got plugged in with that body there. Um, and in in that context, we started having this conversation around what alternative emergency response or mental health first response, civilian responders um, looks like, could look like for our city. Um, and so this is an image of um, a, a demonstration that I went to where actually I met one of the other founding members of the Columbus Safety Collective. We we had um, seen each other on a, a chat on the Discord and then we ran into each other at that protest. And um, we have been in this work now, you know, going on three years um, trying to, to, to push this as a piece of something we want our city to be investing in. And so while this was happening, um, you know, during that summer and, and that the subsequent um, winter into the spring of uh, the winter of 20, spring of 21, our city launched a reimagining public safety process, which was a uh, a series of um, uh, public hearings uh, through city council, as well as a community facing survey um, to have some of these conversations that were happening across the country. Um, and they had broken it into a, a couple of tranches, one around violence prevention, one around alternative response, another around police accountability. Um, so because my colleagues and I that I met through the people's budget kind of had different jobs and like different titles that we weren't necessarily using in that space, we formed the Columbus Safety Collective basically to make our introductions cleaner so that we could all show up, say like, hey, we're from the safety, the Columbus Safety Collective. Um, as we started to meet with members of council, um, folks in public safety to, to really articulate the need for this kind of service here. And so, as I said at the beginning, I'm a social worker by training. I've spent a lot of time um, over my career in some of these bodies um, in the city of Columbus that are have a focus on neighborhood trauma or um, neighborhood and uh, and resilience based approaches. So, I had some of that background. Um, some of my colleagues, we had an economist from uh, from local university, somebody uh, working in the reproductive justice space, and just like a number of people that really gravitated to this issue of um, of non police response. So we formed the Safety Collective just basically as a container for that advocacy so that we could all be working together and pushing on this specific issue. Um, so a couple of things came out of that reimagined advocacy since then. And one was this survey that the city of Columbus did during that process. And so um, the, the city uh, released this survey, uh, collecting feedback from folks on what they felt about the current public safety systems. Um, got over 4,000 responses to it. Um, my colleague who is an economist will point out that it was not a, a scientific sampling and so isn't necessarily representative of the city of Columbus, um, but was the city's best effort to collect input from um, the people of our city on what they feel about this issue. And so what we found here was that 80 to 85% of folks who responded to this said that they were somewhat or very comfortable with non-police teams being used for a range of responses currently often responded to by law enforcement. So things like mental health crisis, suicide threats, homelessness issues, general behavior issues, um, well checks, not emergency cases. So, so basically the city collected its own data where we got this resounding mandate from folks that like they want and support this type of programming. And so a piece of what we've been doing as the safety collective all along is to just encourage the city to do, to make good on what they asked people for and to put in place the kind of structures that they received an endorsement for as part of this process. The other thing that I find really fascinating from that data they collected was when you asked people to rank what, um, like made them the, the greatest impact or improvement on public safety and I asked them to rank different things. The, the number one thing that, thing that folks mentioned were social supports, as well as other things like mental health services, um, community programs, um, you, you know, uh, um, these, these things that kind of do these upstream like neighborhood stabilizing um, uh, functions in our community. 
And the the red bar at the bottom of this was um, was uh, um, uniform police patrol. And so um, there was this resounding uh, response from folks that like uniform police patrol is the least important for, um, you know, ensuring safety in our neighborhoods that we really want to see these other kind of services invested in. So that was kind of the landscape on where the safety collective, how we formed and like, the, and our early work in this space. Um, I want to take a moment to kind of to situate our work in this broader framework around movement ecology. Um, because I think that we're trying to do a specific type of advocacy in our work that, um, and we want to like situate it in this framework because um, we think it's helpful to understand like what we're doing as an advocacy group and what we're not doing. So for those that may not have seen this before, movement ecology is a framework that um, puts our social change work into one of three kind of larger buckets. So, um, you know, so personal transformation work is the work that many social workers do, you know, many, many teachers do working like one on one with people to try and, you know, um, change the, the conditions affecting their lives help them deal with the situations or challenges in front of them um, and can be done in a way that is anti-oppressive and like it has this orientation towards broader change. Um, but its focus is working on in with individual people one at a time. Building alternatives work is um, when we think of things like our block level mutual aid cooperatives or, um, you know, some of the uh, these like independent uh, cop watch programs, you know, like independent like uh, organizations that communities form in order to um, create an alternative to systems that currently exist. And these can be really effective to demonstrate a future that that we do not currently see, um, but have their challenges as far as like sustainability and long-term impact and those kind of things. And then changing dominant institutions is what I think most of us think about as our traditional social movement kind of work. So this often gets broken down into three segments of inside game work, which is kind of your, your lobbying, legislative advocacy, engaging in the, in the formal political process, structure organizing, which is like building a base of people to then push decision makers to, um, to make different decisions or to change conditions, and then mass protest, which is what it sounds like when there's a mass consciousness raising event and people um, oftentimes like seemingly spontaneously will gravitate around an issue. And so the, the point of this framework is to say that social movements benefit from and need different approaches to be successful. And that each of these approaches has strengths and drawbacks that like none of them is the only way that you can get to a future that we want to see. Um, and that we often depend on each other to be successful. So we see our work kind of situated at the nexus of this inside game and like structure community organizing approach. Most of our work has been advocating to people in city government for the need to build this process. And we've been trying to do so by engaging community and lifting up those voices and trying to like, this is in fact what people want, what we need, you should build it now. And so we, I think like as evidenced by the fact that, um, you know, our city allocated money for this program in our most recent operating budget, we've been successful at, like, we've had some wins along the way of changing this narrative and getting a program established. But I think that the work that we are doing would be impossible without the 2020 uprisings and without that consciousness raising moment that happened um, in our city and without folks who have been doing this work, um, you know, to educate people around what's happening in the justice system and people who are building their their block level autonomous alternatives um, to existing policing structures. So we very much see ourselves as being a, a piece of this broader movement um, here in the city of Columbus around um, around police reform, accountability, racial justice, um, and building a, a future that doesn't rely on these carceral systems, um, but you know is is only one way to go about dealing with this problem. So I'd like to transition now to a, a bit of a, this piece about narrative and how we've um, and and how we were talking about this work in the city of Columbus, because I think that we had kind of a unique in our city um, that we were trying to deal with when raising this issue around the need for civilian or non-police response. And this problem is, is something that like folks who are in the, the social service realm um, will think of as you know um, possibly program rich and coordination poor, um, where the city of Columbus had um, and, and still has like a existing suite of alternatives to your traditional police only response. And so as we probably heard along the way, there are 
many cities in the country that are implementing this kind of suite of alternatives, essentially coordinated through through a single office or body or branch of, um, of public safety or another part of city government. Here in Columbus, um, the programs that were already on, on the books um, were the Right Response Unit, uh, which is a, a call diversion program, so social workers embedded in the 911 call center. We already had a, um, a co-responder program of um, social workers paired with police officers known as the Mobile Crisis Response Unit, um, where um, that was originally done with a partnership of our, um, our private um, crisis mental health center. That relationship severed, and now those social workers are being provided through uh, Columbus Public Health. And then we also had two follow-up mechanisms. So the REACT program, uh, which is a police, fire, and a social worker that does follow-up on drug overdose events, and the SPARK program, which is an EMT and a social worker to do follow-up mechanisms with people who are frequent 911 users for non-emergency issues. These folks tend to be older adults, people with disabilities, have issues uh, getting around the house with mobility challenges, would call 911 because it's the only place where someone always answers. And so Spark was meant to provide that service linkage for people that are using emergency services when, for things that you know should be done through like long term, you know, in home nursing or case management. So the city of Columbus had this suite of programs, right? Um, most people in our city don't know that these exist, um, but when you would ask folks in our city about like what we have, um, we would often hear this thing that Columbus is is doing it better than anybody else in the country. Um, that you know we have it figured out here in town. And so a piece of what the safety collective was trying to do was, in fact, point the fact that, like, no, we don't, that, that, that we don't have this problem figured out. Um, and then, in fact, there's like um, a key missing piece in our civilian by not having true civilian response as a primary response mechanism, but also trying to like make this link to this larger budget picture that um, before the most recent operating budget, um, you know, our city had like almost 1900 police officers, around 1600 firefighters. And like 36 people working amongst these four alternative response programs. And, you know, compared to these, um, you know, these hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on, on public safety, you know, like um, close to $360 million uh, for police, you had this four and a half million going to these existing alternatives. So a piece for us is about like what's there and what's not, and, but then also this larger question about investment and policy priorities and how our cities fund um, the kind of responses that people need. So the way that we set out trying to change this narrative was by um, lifting up the stories of people who are, who are impacted by policing and the justice system and engaging community in these conversations and hearing from people once again what it is they want, what makes them feel safe in their neighborhoods and what kind of future they want to see. Um, so we held our People's Safety Forum in the summer of last year, um, where we heard from folks like Ms. Uh, Shauna Wiley, who lost her brother, Jerron Thomas, um, to, uh, uh, he was murdered by Columbus police when calling during a mental health emergency. Um, and Ms. Angie Williams, who uh, similarly had, like, during a mental health crisis, um, had been brutalized by law enforcement. And so why does, like, lift up those stories of people who, like, in very acute ways, needed a different response than what our city currently has to offer. And we, um, and after the People's Safety Forum, we then continued to do this story, the story collection and storytelling in all different sides of our neighborhoods. Um, we held a community safety forum series where we went to each side of town partnering with faith-based organizations to host conversations with the public safety system. And so while stories like, um, Ms. Wiley's are are super important to understanding the the severity of this issue. One thing that struck me through these conversations is is the banality of so many people's experiences with having something where they wanted to call for help but didn't feel comfortable doing so because they knew that police were the only option that that, that they would get. So folks all across our city, all across um you know different different um neighborhoods and and lifestyles and socioeconomic status had the story about like, oh, I, I wanted somebody, but just like didn't have it. And so we took it upon ourselves to continue to source these stories and um, and put them into contact with the folks in government to hopefully fund, um, to, to try and get money for these kind of services. Um, and so we basically have been doing this through like every chance we could to have this conversation, trying to push this narrative that like what Columbus has isn't enough and we need to build a new public safety system that folks can rely on and trust. 
Um, and so we d have did that through things like our Metropolitan Club. Uh, you know, I, I was able to talk on our local NPR station, like anywhere that um, we had the opportunity to have this conversation. I've tried to get this out in front of people to change this narrative that like the city needs something that we don't have, and this is our opportunity to fund it. So after engaging in um, this this messaging campaign around trying to um, to tell the survey what we need in the city of Columbus, um, a huge piece of that for us was having a set of policy pillars that we could all stand on. So the Columbus Safety Collective has always been a coalition of people um, across different advocacy spaces, people with lived experience community members, um, and we needed to know what it is that we wanted and what kind of future we wanted to build with um, alternatives in the city of Columbus. So we ended up landing on a set of five policy pillars to inform how we want this system to be built. Because for us at the Safety Collective, this has never been about just getting, you know, certified, just getting um, people who have a uh, documented mental health condition a response from a mental health clinician. We see this much more as this broader opening to rethink how we do the public safety system and wanted to lay out a set of pillars that we could stand behind that was endorsed by community through this process we engaged in um, of what this system should look like in order to really rebuild trust and get something that meets the needs of our neighbors. So first of these was non-police emergency response, um, that it, that uh, people experiencing crisis deserve an anti-racist health-centered emergency response program that would be accountable to, um, to the people impacted and would promote long-term investment in community supports. Um, so non-police response to us, like because we had this, um, you know, a a call a call diversion program and a co-response program, but not this non-police piece. We we thought this was really essential to, to draw this distinction for people that need help, want someone to call, don't want law enforcement on the scene. The other thing that feels really essential to us is prioritizing community workers. So we know that folks who have um, the most credibility and the most cultural expertise live within our city. They um, are would they make the best responders to to crisis because they're the true first responders anyway. When something goes down on your block, it is neighbors who are there first, and um, you know your formalized first responders come afterward. Um, and so we want, as the city staffs up this program, to think about how we're lifting up that neighborhood expertise. Um, so this is is meant to deal with this issue that we have where um, three quarters of our police officers currently reside outside the city of Columbus. We want to be able to source people from within the city um, and prioritize um, those folks and lift up the expertise that already exists in our neighborhoods. We want the city to invest money in it. We want high quality jobs. We want to see, um, we want to be positioning this as a future that folks can see of a way for them to serve their community. Um, to really build this as a third branch of the public safety system, you know, every every kid probably has some, um, you know, a week in school talking about the community helpers of the doctors and the firefighters and the police officers. We want to position this as a, a key piece of our community helper network, that folks can see themselves in this job as a community crisis responder, um, and that there are pathways to leadership in this so that um, we are able to lift up folks doing this work would be the best suited for it. And then we think that this is an opportunity to deal with the accountability crisis that we currently see in law enforcement. We know that doctrines like qualified immunity and um, just the and the way that our collective bargaining um, agreements are structured uh, insulate uh, a police from um, accountability in events of wrongdoing. So we want the city to stand up a paid advisory board of neighbors that has direct powers of um, of oversight for this body and can provide that ongoing accountability directly to community members. And then finally, we, we want our future funding decisions to actually be based in science. So much of what we encounter in our work is th this mythology of law enforcement, that you invest in police to make us safer, despite the fact that we don't have good evidence that that is actually the case. And, and even despite the proliferation of these, um, of these alternatives, we don't have good, rigorous data on how they're operating. So we think that setting up good evaluation at the beginning with transparent data accessible to anyone, ideally running a randomized control trial so we can say um, with certainty what is happening and what's not happening with these bodies, and that, that that type of rigorous evaluation should guide our future funding decisions. So we provided the city of Columbus a blueprint. Uh, we're asking for $10 million. Uh, we laid out how we would think this program should be structured um, and asked them to, to put up some money for it. Um, 
And then we mobilize our folks once again um, to engage in um, the budget process. So we hosted trainings for folks and, um, and brought people out to testify during our public safety budgeting, um, asking to fund the, um, the, the program that the Safety Collective had laid out. So what happened to that is um, the, the folks in our mayoral administration did not hear that message. Um, they did allocate three and a half million dollars to the existing alternatives that were in place in the city of Columbus but nothing for this non-police response program that we had been talking about. Um, so that that was a blow to us and felt like a barrier that we are still working through. Um, but in the amendment process to the budget, our council president, uh, Shannon Hardin, um, allocated $1.2 million to stand up a non-police response system um, as part of the additional money that council uh, tacked onto our operating budget. And so we're really excited about that and about the, the possibility that it holds, um, but recognize the need to continue to engage the community in this process. So we held a budget debrief um, where we have once again tried to make this case about like how we're doing these investments. And so, you know, police in this 2023 operating budget got $371 million um, um, as, as opposed to this um, around $9 million that we have for our suite of alternatives. So this is something that gets talked about a lot, but when we think about as far as a piece of the total pie, there is a lot of work for us to do here as far as shifting our public safety services to be what the community. So as far as where we're at at the present, um, there's this ongoing need um, for us to be maintained, to be engaged in this process and to insert community voices into the implementation phase. So we see this ongoing need for buy-in amongst public safety um, and are we're currently working through networks like the ones um, that you know are established by conferences like these to make connections and get connected with technical expertise and training to help put those people in touch with um, our our folks here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and so we really see this as an opportunity to build in these pieces around accountability and oversight at the beginning of this process, so that we can um, build a program from the ground up that our neighbors want to be invested in. So we're continuing to try and stay in front of people. Um, we have a, an ongoing newsletter. Uh, folks want to connect with us. Um, we just wrapped up um, some uh, some petition signing campaigns where uh, we had um, our petition for, uh, uh, there's an abortion access petition going around in, um, in the state of Ohio right now uh, that we're collecting petitions and doing our public safety teaching um, to try and harness some of that energy at the moment and keep this issue of, um, of policing and non-police response in front of our neighbors. So um, really appreciate everyone listening today. Uh, if you're curious about the work that we're doing, if you want to connect with us, um, hear about where we've traveled so far, or um, have um, some guidance that we could probably use uh, from those who are further along in this process, please feel free to drop us a line. Um, you can scan this QR code uh, to uh, to get connected with our email list um, so you can stay up to date with what we're doing. Um, and we're on social media at SEBA Safety Collective, and you can find our stuff on our link tree. Really grateful to conference organizers um, and uh, hope that everyone uh, enjoys the rest of the conference and has a good weekend ahead. Thanks so much.